Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, uh, today uh, I will discuss lecture number 20 uh, of the course uh, titled Psychology of Stress, Health and Wellbeing. Uh, so, today's lecture is uh, titled as you know, Socio-Demographic Factors and Happiness. So, uh, before we talk about today's lecture, uh, let me have a brief recap of the last lecture uh, that is lecture number 19. So, in the last lecture, uh, we talked about the concept of happiness and we basically, you know, addressed two questions. One is what is happiness and uh, second is do we know what makes us happy? So, these two questions we have addressed in the last lecture. So, we have discussed that the concept of happiness, you know, happiness is an universe, is a universal goal that everybody pursues happiness through various ways and various pathways. Uh, particularly and uh, people define happiness in uh, various ways, you know, everybody has their own definition of uh, happiness and uh, then we have discussed from the perspective of psychological literature that we uh, define happiness or conceptualize happiness in terms of subjective well-being. This is the term that we use we generally try to avoid the word happiness because of so many uh, connotations associated with it. So, subjective well-being or happiness uh, uh, in psychology, we typically measure it in terms of you know emotions, emotional experiences and life satisfaction. Uh, so, more specifically uh, higher the positive emotions, lower the negative emotions and higher the life satisfaction, uh, the higher will be your happiness or uh, subjective well-being. So, positive emotions, negative emotions and life satisfaction are generally uh, are the important indicators to measure subjective well-being or happiness. So, from the psychological perspective, we specifically mean by this, this is what we have discussed in the uh, last lecture. So, particularly you know the idea that uh, we discussed that is then with the rise of positive psychology as a branch uh, of study in psychology in the last few decades you know. Uh, the study on happiness and well-being has really you know, uh, increased tremendously in terms of research, uh, primarily because now focus is given more on uh, these positive dimensions of human experiences and functionings. And more specifically, you know, a lot of reliable and valid measures and instruments were developed uh, to you know, make reliable conclusions and valid conclusions about these things. Before that, it was mostly under the purview of philosophers who are mostly speculating about these things. Now, we have measures and data and based on the evidence based data, we can talk about such topics. Uh, then we have discussed uh, one particular model of happiness uh, proposed by Ruth Winhoven, a sociologist who uh, did a lot of research in the sci scientific study of psychology, uh, scientific uh, study of happiness, where he uh, tried to define uh, you know uh, uh, happiness particularly you know from the perspective of quality of life and life satisfactions. So, he proposed four qualities of life now which are you know uh, livability of the environment, utility of life, life ability of the person and the life satisfaction and he particularly equated happiness with the concept of life satisfaction. Then we have also discussed the different types of life satisfactions and in the uh, last section of the uh, lecture, we have addressed the question, do we really know what makes us happy? Uh, in that context, we have discussed uh, the concept of effective forecasting and impact bias. So, the idea of effective forecasting is that you know, when we predict about the emotional consequences of a future event. So, we, so if, we, if, we, if we kind of predict 
or try to think that if some X event happens in future, what will be my emotional consequences? So, effective forecasting talks about that and research particularly shows we generally mispredict uh, uh, while you know uh, predicting about uh, the future emotional consequences of future events. Particularly, we overestimate the intensity and duration of the emotional consequences of a future event. So, and that may influence our decision process. We have uh, looked into all these aspects and we have also discussed the causes behind this of overestimation which is uh, called as you know, impact bias where we overestimate the intensity and duration of a or duration of emotional consequences of a future event. And the reason spe specifically we have discussed are you know focalism uh, which basically means you know that while we predict about a future event we specifically only focus on that event and its consequences. But when actually that even happens, whether it is positive or negative, so many other factors influences our emotional reactions. So, that is why while predicting we generally overestimate either positive emotions, positive consequences or negative consequences uh, in terms of happiness or sorrow. Uh, so, these are some of the things that we have you know, discussed in the last lecture. So, today we will talk about Social demography factors and happiness. So, this is uh, lecture number 2 of module 7 and overall it is uh, lecture number 20. So, today we will talk about how certain objective aspects of our life or object objective realities or life circumstances of our life, how they influence happiness, which is primarily subjective experience. So, how objective parameters, particularly socio demographic factors, influences our uh, sense of happiness or our feelings of happiness. So, in this context, we will discuss, uh, you know, discuss four uh, socio demographic factors, four factors specifically. Uh, one is income, age, gender, and education. So, how they influence our happiness. So, let us see one by one. So, the relationship between income and happiness, I mean this is uh, people have been interested into this relationship, you know and uh, probably you know you might have uh, you know encountered this question can money buy happiness, you know during your school days in essay competitions or debate competition, this is one of the common topic that we all encounter, you know. So, this question can money buy happiness or how money is important in terms of our happiness. Uh, let us see what research says about that. <coughs> we all may have our own ideas, but let us see some of the research findings in this direction. So, there is an extensive uh, literature or empirical uh, research uh, on the relationship between income and well being or happiness. When we talk about happiness, we are specifically talking about subjective well being which we have explained in the last class. So, a lot of uh, research uh, evidences are available, but the uh, uh, still we do not have a very clear cut picture uh, in terms of relationship between income and happiness. So, the relationship is very complex and still it is not very clear. Economists are very interested into this topic because you know their focus is on income and, and money. So, economists generally uh, they view that income is a sufficient indicator of human well being and uh, increase uh, in the level of income will increase human well being and life satisfaction. So, this is one of the basic idea of economics you know if income rises their well being also rises because you know their uh, buying capacities will increase in terms of objective parameters. However, a uh, lot of empirical studies show that the relationship between subjective indicators such as you know life satisfaction or happiness uh, and the traditional objective uh, indicators such as income, consumption, this relationship is not very strong as we generally think and predict that you know objective parameters such as you know income will strongly influence our sense of happiness, but research generally indicate that relationship is not very strong. So, the relationship is actually weak. Many cross sectional uh, survey data shows a significant positive relationship between income and happiness, uh, but the coefficient is uh, generally small. 
So the there is a relationship and that relationship is positive uh, between one's income and one's happiness level in life. Uh, but the coefficient or correlation between the co correlation coefficient is not very strong. For example, you know, uh, Dinner and Oshi in 2000, uh, they did a cross-sectional survey of a large sample from about 19 countries. Uh, they reported a correlation between income and uh, subjective well-being, which means happiness. Uh, it ranged from 0 0.02 to 0 0.38. So, the correlation coefficient is not very strong. It is either very small or moderate level of coefficient. So, the it is not very, you know, uh, strong correlation and it is uh, the, the uh, result is coming from you know, large data from about 19 countries. So, it is not just about one particular uh, no, sample from particular area, region or country. So, this finding generally indi indicate uh, that subjective well-being increases with income, uh, but at a decreasing uh, marginal rate. What is this meaning? Uh, what is the meaning of this is that you know obviously there is a positive relationship between income and happiness uh, but uh, the relationship is uh, strong up to a point but beyond that it may not influence that strongly so that is the meaning of the diminish diminishing uh, marginal rate up to a point it plays very important role beyond that its role decreases so as we know from our own experiences also particularly you know if your basic necessities uh, if it is not fulfilled uh, for the for people whose basic necessities they are not able to fulfill from their income you know obviously the money plays very important role there is no doubt about it uh, if you are only thinking about you know about you know how to earn for your you know basic necessities such as food clothing and house uh, then obviously you know money will have very strong influence but if one is able to fulfill one's basic need from his income beyond that the role of income will not be that strong so, that is general uh, understanding from the uh, literature and most of the findings shows a relationship in that direction. <coughs> now, in this context of uh, the relationship between uh, income and happiness, you know one particular economist, you know uh, his research is one of the highly cited research. And one of the first economists who talked about the, this relationship, uh, his name is Easterling. So, one of the main research paper, I mean, uh, in the literature on income and happiness, has been Easterling seminal article in 1974. He wrote, it is one of the important articles that stimulated a lot of research in the direction of relationship between income and happiness, and. Uh, and particularly because he is an economist and from the economics perspective people started looking at subjective indicators such as happiness. Uh, and he d wrote many uh, articles and updated uh, his findings later on also. So, uh, there is a concept called Easterlin paradox which he basically found from large scale data. <coughs> so, in this paper and uh, many other paper later on, uh, what Easterlin found or reported that you know there is a paradox of substantial uh, real income growth in western countries over last 50 years. So, over last 50 years uh, there has been substantial rise in per capita income particularly in the western countries, western developed countries. Uh, but he found there was no uh, corresponding rise in reported happiness level. So, per capita income uh, has been rising in the last few decades. Uh, in the western countries particularly, but he found there was no corresponding rise in the happiness level in the population of those countries. So, he kind of you know seen it as a kind of paradox. So, the idea in economics was that with the rise of per capita income happiness should also increase, but from the time series data he found with the passage of time per capita income is increasing, uh, but correspondingly happiness level is not increasing, it is almost flat. So, that is the meaning of Easterlin paradox. So, he also found many a few other things, we will discuss that also. So, some of the graphs uh, that uh, know, uh, we can see here, for example, this is a data for US from 1973 to 2003 and uh, that shows you know the graph of per capita income, rise in per capita income and happiness level in the you know, 
in the in, in population of uh, United Nations. So you can see uh, which the dotted line is basically you know uh, per capita income and the black line is for happiness level uh, uh, no, uh, graph. So you can see the per capita income is kind of gradually rising from 1973 to 2003 this is the data they have analyzed. So there is a constant rise. However, if you see the happiness, uh, uh, the line for happiness, it is almost constant. You know, there was not much rise. There are bits and pieces where you no, know, there were in some years there was some rise, but mostly it is flat. So similar uh, results were found for other countries, other European countries such as UK, France, Germany, Italy, and Netherlands. Almost similar. It is the happiness level seems to remain constant or stagnant in the last few decades, although there was a substantial uh, rise in real per capita income. So, more specifically what Sterling paradox talks about is that you know at a point in time both among and within nations happiness varies directly with income. So, generally when cross sectional data or when the data were taken at a particular point in time that is called as a cross sectional uh, data. So, generally those data indicates uh, as a, a positive relationship between income and happiness. So, the rise in income there is a uh, rise in happiness level, but obviously it is it's, uh, up to a point then obviously it is not that strong. But over time in the time series data such as for 10 years and more happiness you know uh, does not increase when a country's income rises. So, generally what he said when a, when he analyzed time series data with the passage of time what how a phenomena changes uh, uh, what he found is that happiness is not increasing when countries overall per capita income uh, is increasing it is not increasing at that proportion. But in the cross sectional data generally shows even within nation and uh, across nation happiness generally there is a positive relationship between happiness and income. So, this is the paradox that is he is talking about which is called as uh, Sterling paradox. So, in cross sectional data happiness uh, seems to increase with income though at a decreasing rate uh, within and across nations. However, in a time series data happiness does not increase when a country's income increases. So, with the passage of time it is not increasing. Some research indicate that Sterling uh, paradox may not hold under all circumstances. So, there are some counter evidences to that, but uh, generally uh, the Sterling paradox you know there are many evidences to it and it indicates some important connection between income and happiness, but there are some evidences which shows it may not hold for all under all circumstances. So, we will not go into that part, but the idea is you know. Uh, it indicates a very significant relationship between income and happiness in the large scale data particularly time series data. So, what could be the reason behind this that in a cross sectional data generally there is a positive relationship obviously the relationship which may, may not be very strong, but still there is a positive relationship, but in a time series data with the passage of time with the rise in income in a particular country uh, there is no substantial rise in happiness level in the population of, con of countries particularly in the uh, western developed countries. So, uh, two possible explanations are given uh, for this phenomena uh, one is called as you know social comparison theory another is called as a theory of adaptation. So, these two are generally called as you know uh, relative income theory uh, which may explain uh, that you know why the rise in income especially with the passage of time is not really impacting very strongly to our rise in happiness level. So, let us see one by one what these theories talk, talk about. So, social comparison theory. Uh, suggest that you know people the idea of social comparison is basically we constantly compare ourselves with other people. 
and we generally don't com just compare with other people any just any other people generally we compare with our reference group with a peer group people who are similar to us so we generally tend to make comparison with people you know who are in our peer group or in our reference group so this is a constant thing that we all do all the time we keep on compare with ourselves with other people and maybe consciously or unconsciously and this social comparison plays very important role in our happiness level so the theory of social comparison suggests that people just do not assess their life in isolation they don't just you know assess their life only from their perspective of their life but we rather we compare our life with others and particularly in the context of income also uh, uh, this comparison may play a very important role compare their income and achievements uh, with those around them called as peer group or reference group so we compare and our happiness is kindly you know very strongly derived from those comparison process what is the outcome of this comparison so we look into social comparison in much more detail in some of the in one upcoming lecture where we'll see how it really influences our happiness level here we'll specifically focus on income and you know comparison of income so our happiness is very strongly influenced by social comparison comparison with other people we are happy if we have generally more than others and unhappy if we are less than others it's a very general understanding so generally when we compare and find ourselves in an advantageous situation that we are uh, having more than others it may be income or any other thing so generally people tend to feel happier uh, and obviously when they find themselves in a disadvantaged position as compared to others they tend to feel less happy so therefore what happens in the context of sterling data is that you know uh, there is a proportional increase in in all incomes in an economy or a country uh, would leave average happiness unaffected in line with the sterling paradox so what is happening for western countries the average per capita income is increasing for all people so it is not just for a few individuals so when a country's per capita income increases the idea is for most of the people that there is a rise in income so if you see average or relative income is not increasing so so there is a rise in income for everybody but for relatively it may not very much so so if my income is in increasing so people in my peer group or my reference group their income is also increasing so there is not much difference in terms of relative difference so so according to the social comparison theory it is one's relative income that plays more important role than absolute income uh, which determines life satisfaction or happiness so in the context of sterling paradox so with the rise of per capita income in many countries western countries there is not much change in relative income so it is income is increasing for all so uh, from that perspective from the social comparison perspective there is not much you know uh, your average happiness is not really influenced by it in terms of comparison if your income is increasing others income is also increasing so in terms of social comparison there is not much advantage in that sense so your average happiness is, remains unaffected even though your absolute income is increasing so it is the relative income that plays more important role and in the context of western countries that relative income is not really you know is not much changed so that is why our average happiness is also kind kind of remains unaffected so this is one of the explanation that is given it is possible that you know the social comparison theory may explain why you know even though in that in the time series data there is a per capita income rise in income in many countries but happiness level still remains same one possible could be you know there is not much change in the relative income there is a change in absolute income uh, so therefore our in terms of social comparison there is not much change in terms of our average happiness or happiness that we derive by comparing ourselves with others the next theory uh, that is also given a possible explanation for sterling paradox is called as you know theory of adaptation 
Uh, adaptation basically involves comparison of current situation with the past situation. So, how we generally there is a comparison here also, but it is mostly with your present situation with your past situation. And by adaptation, we means we kind of with the change in life circumstances, there is a change in our emotional experiences also. So, so th but that change is very transitory. After some times, we adapt to it adapt to the new life situation and our emotional consequences or emotional experiences goes back to the earlier level. So, that is adaptation. So, we adapt to life changes in life situation uh, you, know, you know by uh, <coughs> by you know making adjustment to the new situation. So, that is the meaning of adaptation. So, adaptation theory says that increase in the context of income uh, that increase in income will temporarily increase people's happiness. Obviously, when there is an increase in income, so there is an your happiness will in increase, but that increase is temporary in the sense that over time again we will adjust to this higher income. So, our life situation change and we will adjust to that new life situation uh, such that uh, their happiness revert back to their original level. So, after some times it becomes there is nothing much excitation about it. So, we kind of get adapted to it and also our aspiration rises. So, our income rises, our aspiration also rises. So, kind of again you know uh, we adapt to the increased uh, increase income, uh, but uh, that increase income may also increase our aspiration levels which again you know revert back our uh, increase in happiness level may again come back to our original baseline level. So, this adaptation neutralizes the effect of income rise when aspiration rises at the same rate. So, with the rise of aspiration, you are, no, you are no longer so happy with your rise in income. You may again aim for some other target. So, we get adapted to changes in our life circumstances. It may be changes in terms of income. Uh, so, there is a temporary gain in happiness, but it reverts back to again to our original level. So, after some time it is no longer that exciting again. So, and also our aspiration rises uh, which may also decrease our uh, you know excitement and the happiness that we gain from this income rise. So, uh, so in the context of income and happiness uh, we see the relationship e there is a positive relationship there is no doubt about it. Uh, income plays very important role in our happiness level and particularly you know till we uh, you know achieve a level of income which fulfills our basic needs. Uh, nowadays obviously, it is also difficult to define what is the basic need. It is you know basic uh, need, it is also const continuously shifting. So, the, there is a positive relationship, but it is not very strong and uh, it is very clear that you know uh, that effect of income on our happiness level uh, may not be very direct and it may be mediated by many other psychological factors uh, such as you know uh, the social comparison that we do, the goals that we have, the aspirations that we have all these things may influence uh, how income rise may influence our happiness. So, it is not just external object situation of life that influences, but how we you know. Uh, how other psychological factors come into the come into play in terms of aspiration, in terms of goals, in terms of how we compare ourselves with others. All this may also influence how income influences our happiness level. So, there may be many mediators to it. Now, uh, see the relation let us see the relationship between age and happiness. Again, you know there has been uh, many research in that direct in this direction researchers tried to find out the relationship between age and happiness. However, there seems to be no clear cut consensus on the direction of relationship between age and happiness. What is the exact relationship? Still, we do not have a very clear cut consensus on this uh, whether you know, with the rise of age, whether happiness increases or decreases. Uh, we have all kinds of research findings. So, there is no clear cut evidence that we can talk about here. Some early psychological studies suggested that there is no relationship, there is no age happiness relationship. So, there is no relationship at all some research suggests that. Some uh, studies reported that you know life satisfaction increases with age. 
some studies also show that you know as we age our happiness level actually increases. A growing body of research also suggests you know that the relationship between age and happiness is U shaped. So, some show there is no relationship, some show there is a positive relationship and a growing body and actually a lot of evidence actually suggest that there is a possible U shape relationship between age and happiness. What is the meaning of this U shape relationship? So, this is also called as happiness U curve which talks about relationship between age and happiness and this U curve basically uh, means what let us see. So, many large scale surveys uh, on age and happiness has reported uh, a U shaped curve in the relationship between age and happiness. Uh, this U shaped curve is also called as happiness U curve. Now, this U shaped curve basically uh, reflects or basically indicates uh, that you know average happiness or life satisfaction is lowest in the middle age which may be from 40 to 50 or 55 or something. So, that is we consider it as a middle age and then again begins to recover and move up after that. So, U shape means uh, the happiness level people generally they report lowest level of happiness if they are they consider their life or if you consider life period uh, from their you know young age to old age uh, people generally uh, report lowest level of happiness in their mid life somewhere between 40 to 50 or 55. Then as be, as we become older this happiness level again increases and it is much higher in the younger age also so it is lowest in the middle age so this is the meaning of u shaped curve uh, one of the most comprehensive study in this direction was conducted by uh, these two uh, researcher blanchflower and oswald in 2008 uh, who combined cross sectional data over 60 countries and they reported uh, by and large u shaped relationship between happiness and age. So, one of the very large scale data shows there is a possible you know, u shaped relationship between age and happiness. Uh, so, and then many other studies also supported this uh, result. This u shaped was found in many other studies also. And all these studies obviously, you know they controlled the confounding factors such as income, health, employment and gender. So, there are maybe many other factors which may influence our happiness, uh, their impact was cancelled out and it was specifically seen how age and age is connected to happiness. So, obviously, these relationships are always looked at after controlling other factors because they may also influence. So, the, uh, the uh, graph is uh, something like this, this U shape curve is so most of the data shows it is you know like this. So, this side if we show uh, you know life satisfaction or happiness. So, so the graph is somehow like this. So, this is the meaning of so. So, as the age progresses, so, so in the lower age group obviously, the happiness level or life satisfaction level is generally high. So, as we proceed uh, generally you know then it lowers down and it goes at the bottom generally at the middle age and it slowly slowly again increases. So, this is how uh, it is generally a lot of data actually indicates uh, the relationship is something like this. So, again uh, I mean uh, although it is not very you know, consensus kind of finding, uh, but a lot of research indicates there is a possible U shape uh, relationship. Uh, uh, so, what could be some possible reasons in that context you know, at least a lot of data indicates that may not be every everybody shows this relationship, but you know a lot of people at least data shows you know in their life you know there is an U shape relationship. Uh, 
So, what could be some of the possible uh, you know, explanations for this? So, one thing is in the people generally talk about you know there is a midlife crisis in the sense that in the it, it is the in the midlife you know you have stress and a uh, lot of stress and responsibilities are at the peak. And uh, generally you know some researchers indicate there is some people experience midlife crisis. So, in terms of psychological also you feel kind of you know <coughs> uh, certain crisis where you know uh, you feel no longer you are younger and and almost half of your life is gone. So, there there is some possible you know psychological negative impact of that also. Uh, so, uh, in terms of anxieties and other things and also in terms of responsibilities obviously midlife is probably where you know you have highest level of responsibilities and stress of life. Uh, so, possibly uh, these are some of the reasons where you know uh, possibly for these reasons people may experience the dip in the level of happiness in their midlife, uh, which may be associated with the concept of midlife crisis. Again, we should remember not everybody goes through a midlife crisis and uh, this U-shaped car may not be you know true for everybody. So, we should you know kind of keep that in mind. At the older age, now, although there is a physical decline in terms of you know uh, your uh, you know, decline in, 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 the, in the physical health. Uh, some research indicate as people become older, especially after 60s and 70s, you know, people uh, generally, you know, their sense of happiness and well-being also increases. Uh, then, primarily because you know, shifting the f their focus of life shifts. Now they they are no longer in the workplace with the competition, with promotion and all the stresses and burdens of uh, you know life that we experience. You know, it comes to peak when we are in the midlife. Uh, after retirement or when we become older, focus of our life shifts uh, in the sense that you know uh, we gave more values to social connection in the old age and we are no longer into social competition too much and comparison on all this fades out in the old age and we give more importance to social connection. So, we may have few people around us and we give more importance to loving relationship with what whoever is around us and uh, maybe you know your spouse your you know grandchildren whatever it is so our values shifts from too much of competition and comparison it shifts from those aspects to more social connection so that is why uh, people even though in that there is a decline in the health and other aspects still people experience higher happiness and you no know, well being in the old age so, this could, could be another reason why it again increases after midlife. So, these are some of the possible explanations. So, we do not know exactly and these reasons may change from person to person also, so, but these are some broad patterns that can be ex used to explain you know this uh, uh, happiness u curve. So, it is worth pointing out that the happiness curve is based on average. So, this curve was basically based on the average taken from data. So, that means, everybody may not go through the same graph. So, it is based on average from the large scale data. Now, let us see uh, the relationship between gender and happiness. Uh, now, uh, in the context of gender, we are talking about you know, uh, gender in terms of males and females. Some research, research uh, generally indicates lot of research actually indicates you know there is a possible gender difference in terms of psychological disorders, in terms of prevalence or you know diagnosis of psychological disorders. So, there is a difference in ill being and my misery. For example, you know um, uh, some research indicate that women are twice more vulnerable and likely to be diagnosed with depression and anxiety as compared to men. So, some psychological disorder the prevalence are more in female population as compared to males such as depression and anxiety. However, uh, for men and research also indicate that men are much more some people research indicates even some like 5 times vulnerable to alcoholism and antisocial personality disorders. So, this phenomena such as you know alcoholism and uh, antisocial personality disorder 
these are much more prevalent in males as compared to females. So, there is a possible gender difference in terms of psychological disorders and uh, the reasons are not still very clear why it is this these uh, differences appears in population. Some indicate some genetic biological reasons, uh, but many researcher also report that there may not be actual difference in terms of male and female in terms of reports of psychological disorder such as depression and anxiety. It may be possible that females report more, uh, they express their feelings more and they seek more help. So, therefore, they are more likely to be diagnosed with uh, disorders such as depression and anxiety as compared to men. So, there may not be actually you know, these differences, but it is the difference of report of such a disorders. So, uh, still it is not very clear the, uh, the reasons, there may be some uh, biological hormonal reasons. Uh, there may not be actual reason also. So, it is not still very clear. So, uh, in terms of happiness obviously research so there is not much difference. Uh, research did not find any specific difference between in, in terms of gender, in terms of experience of well being and happiness. So, there is not much evidence of gender difference in the report of happiness and well being. Most of the large scale studies and meta analysis actually shows showed a very little or no gender difference in the happiness and well being. So, there is no much difference in terms of males and female in terms of reports of happiness and well being. But the difference was found in terms of psychological disorders. So, for example, in a meta analysis of 146 studies, you know, gender accounted for less than 1 percent of people's global well being. So, which is very negligible. So, gender did not account for any difference actually in terms of uh, well being and this finding uh, seems to generalize in the worldwide. So, it is not just a phenomena of a particular country, it seems to be true for most of the countries. In another study uh, also in a sample of 16 nations indicated equal number of males and females about 80 percent of men and 80 percent of females said that they are at least fairly satisfied with the life. So, again the percentages are very similar almost same in terms of report of happiness and life satisfaction. Uh, the similar findings were reported in other studies also among university students from 39 countries also. So, many uh, large scale surveys shows you know there is no gender difference as such in terms of report of happiness and well being, but there seems to be some gender difference in terms of reports of psychological disorders such as depression and anxiety. The last let us see uh, the relationship between um, education and happiness. So, again in this direction also there is not much clear evidence uh, the relationship between education and happiness and there is not many clear evidence. Uh, research have reported all kinds of relationship for example, you know studies have pointed out all kinds of relationship between education and subjective well being means here basically we are talking about happiness. So, some uh, studies suggested a positive linear relationship which basically means as your education level increases your happiness also increases some studies supported that finding. Some studies reported a positive non linear relationship. So, there is a positive relationship, but it is not linearly increasing which basically means middle level educated people seems to report highest level of well being. And some uh, research also reported there is no relationship and some even reported negative relationship. So, as your education level actually increases you know your happiness level actually goes down. So, all kinds of possible relationships were indicated in the research finding depending on what kind of sample, what kind of cultural background so many things may play a role here you know so the, so there is no any clear uh, relationship as indicated in the research so what could be some of the possible explanation why you know even education can actually in some context increase your happiness in some context it may actually decrease your happiness so in this context you know one particular researcher uh, his name is campbell uh, he gave some possible explanation which still can hold valid. He suggested that you know education can contribute as well as be a detriment to subjective well being. On the one hand education can positively contribute to subjective well being or happiness by providing resources to accomplish life goals. 
So, education in many contexts increases your life satisfaction or your happiness level primarily because you know it increases your skills and your resources by which you can acquire or accomplish many goals in your life. It gives you a lot of advantages obviously there is no doubt about it. So, with the rise of education your skills and your you know um, many you know your resources in places and you are able to more likely to achieve many goals higher level of goals in your life. So, in that sense it will increase your subjective well being. Sometimes it may also actually negatively impact subjective well being uh, primarily by rising our aspiration level too much to the point that it is hard to achieve those goals. So, as with the rise of your education level your aspirations also rises. So, sometimes some people their aspiration rises too much in the sense they set certain goals which they find it difficult to achieve and they are no longer able to work and do goals which are at the lower level because their aspiration level has you know, gone very high and they are not, not able to you know, achieve those goals. So, in that context sometimes it may also reduce your happiness. So, uh, uh, the relationship between education and happiness may be mediated by many subjective factors such as goals and aspirations. So, it is very clear you know uh, in all these uh, objective indicators and socio demography factors that we have talked about you know and you know you know they influence there is no doubt about it our happiness level, uh, but mostly their influence may not be very direct in that sense, uh, but their influence is mediated by many other psychological factors. You know. So, for example, in the context of education, it is not education that is actually directly influencing your happiness level, but how you, how other, how you kind of psychological factors plays role in that. You know. So, basically, what is your aspiration? What is your goal in life? Uh, in terms of, you know, what do you want to do with your education? what is your aspiration with your education, what is the goal that you are setting to reach by using your education level. So, those things plays much more important role than just education level. So, that is why all these differences in the research findings we see in all these socio demographic variables primarily because it is not direct, they are not directly influencing probably and they are mediated by many internal psychological subjective factors. So, uh, some concluding thoughts. So, it is evident that many objective parameters of our life or objective realities of life or life circumstances such as your income, your socio demographic factors, other socio demographic factors such as you know your age, your education and so many other factors. Uh, they play role in, in our happiness and well being. There is no doubt about it. They play very important, imp uh, important role, but they are uh, impact may not be very strong at least most of the research indicates that. So, the relationship between objective indicators such as socio demographic factors and subjective indicators such as happiness is not very strong. So, happiness is mostly subjective and it is an outcome of many subjective factors. So, the relationship there is a relationship, but it is not very strong. So, uh, ultimately you know it is very clear that you know Mm, our happiness ultimately largely depends on how we think and deal with those objective life circumstances. So, ultimately you know it boils down to the fact. So, it is not age that can actually directly influence your happiness or it is your, or your gender or your education level or your income. All this influences us, but primarily it is mediated by our thought processes how we think, what is, what is our aspirations, what is our life goals. All this will influence how actually uh, these factors uh, impacts our happiness level. So, you might remember ABC model that we have discussed in the mental ways of coping, where we said it is not the objective circumstances that cause emotional consequences. So, A activating event never causes C. So, uh, if you remember A, B, C model. So, A is here uh, basically means events activating events and C are the emotional consequences and B is basically your belief systems or automatic or thought processes. So, there we have discussed it is not the event that causes 
see it is the event never causes consequences it is how this event stimulates our thought processes or belief system they ultimately causes emotional consequences such as you know uh, happiness sadness or whatever it is so this is also true in this context also so we'll discuss uh, also you know a little bit more detail about you know how various this this our you know subjective factors and the activities that we do in our life how they influences our happiness uh, uh, in 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 the next few lectures such as from i think lecture 24 or 25 we'll talk about a, a model called sustainable happiness model there we'll talk about you know uh, how some uh, how some of these you know mediators or subjective factors may influence our happiness level and how can we uh, work towards a sustainable happiness so we'll uh, talk more details about some of these important factors so with this i stopped today's lecture thank you